Good morning, everyone. We're going to be starting in just a, a minute. We're allowing a few more folks to join us. I'm Ty Buckner, and it is my pleasure to be uh, with you this morning to moderate our fourth Guilford College Last Thursday Coffee Chat. This is a program that Ara Sergui, our Vice President for Advancement, um, inaugurated several months ago, uh, in part uh, in response to uh, our pandemic situation and wanting to make sure that we made strong connections with Guilfordians over these several uh, uh, months. And um, we're just delighted to have so many Guilfordians with us again today. It is 1030 and we want to be um, observant of everyone's time. We're going to begin our coffee chat program this morning uh, with a moment of silence. Thank you. For those of us, uh, for those of you just joining us, again, I'm Ty Buckner. I'm Associate Vice President for Alumni and Constituent Relations. I work in advancement along with my colleagues, our Vice President, R. S. Joy, my counterpart in philanthropy, Jarrett Stahl, uh, our Director of Donor Relations and Stewardship, Stephanie Davis, who's been instrumental in helping put on these programs, and I appreciate that. I feel a little bit like um, Kate or Jose sitting in for Lester Holt on the NBC News on the weekend, um, but I'm going to do my best uh, to follow the uh, outline that Ara has set up in these last several months. He is participating with us today. He's going to enjoy this program along with all of us, uh, but I am excited to have an opportunity to, to uh, be in this role uh, with you. So um, again, our fourth coffee chat, the uh, topic is ethical leadership and we have two delightful um, speakers. Before we get there though, a couple of housekeeping uh, matters. Um, in a little while, I'm going to invite you to offer questions via the chat uh, that will be uh, answered uh, toward the end of the program. We also collected some questions in advance Please know that we have uh, received those and considered them and will incorporate those as is possible. Want to make sure that everyone uh, is muted and I believe we uh, have that taken care of so that there's no um, ambient noise. I'd like to introduce to you uh, the uh, featured speakers today. I, I know that a number of you have enjoyed our coffee chats to date and have uh, uh, very much appreciated uh, the programs that uh, Tim and Michelle and Barbara participated in along with Ara, very timely topics. And we believe certainly that the leadership topic that will be um, our topic for today will also be extremely timely and enjoyable and informative. So our two featured uh, guests are uh, Vance Ricks and Steve Mincarini. They are known to some of you, and after the program, I hope uh, they'll be known well to all of you. Vance majored in philosophy as a Guilford student and graduated in 1991. He completed his doctoral studies at Stanford and returned to Guilford in 1998 as a faculty member. His teaching, his writings, and research focus on areas in moral philosophy from gossip and social media, to John Stuart Mill's Secular Religion. He's currently co-editing a book focused on the moral dimensions of so-called prestige television shows. Now recently, Vance was appointed Interim Associate Academic Dean at Guilford in a restructuring of the Provost's Office. 
Steve completed his PhD in higher education administration at UNCG in, in 2018 with his dissertation on collegiate US leadership development programs. His undergraduate degree is in biology from the College of William and Mary, his master's uh, from Maryland College Park in college student personnel. Steve has presented at national conferences and written several articles and book chapters on leadership and creating social change. So welcome to both Vance and Steve. So um, I'm really glad you guys are our featured speakers uh, for our coffee chat. I'd like to give you a chance to make uh, some opening remarks. Uh, let's start with Vance. Oh, I get to go first. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thanks to all of you for being here this morning. Some of you have known me since I was 18 or 19. So that's helping to serve as a good reality check for me on uh, anything I might say. Um, you know, I, it's good to have people in the audience who uh, can <laughs> not let my head get too big. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this session uh, and to be talking with Steve this morning. One of the things that's most exciting to me about the new administrative role that, uh, that Ty just mentioned uh, that I've taken on uh, is that now it gives me a chance to actually work in the same office with Steve. So um, we're not just teaching or talking, sorry, at a theoretical level about, uh, about leadership and many of its challenges, but uh, we're, we're getting a, a real life uh, opportunity to practice some of what we're talking about this morning. And I just want to also offer my greetings and uh, say uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the topic. I, this is one of my uh, lifelong research topic areas. Uh, also love practicing and talking to college students and others about leadership and how to uh, demonstrate uh, your leadership potential. Uh, and it has been a pleasure to work with Vance uh, over the past few years on establishing ethical leadership as a cornerstone of the Guilford education and um, I look forward to this conversation and the opportunity to share a little bit more about our thoughts on ethical leadership during this time. I'd like to simply add before we get into the program that uh, these two um, team members at Guilford are playing pivotal roles as we move into a reopening of the college soon and I want to thank them for their contributions in that area. But for today the topic is leadership and it's certainly one of the most researched and written about topics, yet so many people know very little about it. Um, Steve, what is leadership? Well, um, Ty, that is a great question, and I don't know if I have the exact answer, but I'll give you an answer. How's that? Um, when we start thinking about leadership, uh, one of the things that we need to contemplate is uh, how we come to understand leadership, uh, and where we see leadership uh, has been described as the most easily recognizable, but most under, uh, under, not understood uh, concept between two individual people. <laughs> so we see it everywhere. We know what it is, but it's really difficult to define. And people have tried to define uh, leadership. If you were to go out there and just type in leadership in books or leadership articles, uh, you would see uh, a plethora of examples of what people see as leadership. And uh, even to the point where, as researchers are talking about leadership, there's even over 220 different definitions of leadership. Uh, most of the time with some sort of qualifying or adjective before the word leadership. So in this case, we're talking about ethical leadership, but there's also relational leadership, there's transformational leadership. Uh, there's all these different types of leadership. Uh, and so we'll be talking uh, a little bit later more about some theories and traits and behaviors and things along those lines. But really, we need to start thinking about what the foundational level, level of our understanding of leadership is. Um, are you born with leadership? Is it nurtured? Is, are there certain situations where if I demonstrate it in a particular way, it is seen as leadership? In a different situation, it's not seen as leadership? Uh, is there such thing as good or bad leadership? Uh, so there, there are these types of things, these sort of underlying questions associated with leadership uh, that we start to, need to start to tease apart. Um, and one of the things that I also want to share with you is we're talking right now about leadership and not the word leader. So oftentimes we might get those two com uh, conflated in understanding the differences between those two. 
A leader is a person or a position. Leadership is a process, a way of engaging with uh, other, other people. So uh, oftentimes those two things just get really conflated and we, it's tough to tease apart. Um, there are people with titles that demonstrate leadership. There are people that, with titles that don't demonstrate leadership. There are people without titles that demonstrate leadership. So having a title, uh, having a role may give you an opportunity to demonstrate leadership more than not having the title or the role. But just because you have a title or role doesn't necessarily mean you um, are demonstrating leadership. Mm, thank you, Steve. And Vance, what about your definition of leadership? To build on what Steve said, um, I, would, um, I would say I think of leadership in the context of this morning's discussion as a sort of directed influence. And so what I mean by that is partly to build on the distinction Steve just drew between leadership and leader, that there are people who are very influential who might not know that they are um, and who might not occupy a particular position in some sort of organizational chart, but who are nonetheless um, exerting a great deal of charisma, let's say, or, or you know, someone that people pay attention to and, and maybe try to emulate or listen to. So it's not simply that you're influential that, that um, opens the door to leadership, but it, it's the ability to maybe take that kind of influence and direct it in particular ways. So the, the dimension for us to be thinking about ethics as we talk about leadership um, is connected to that, that con concept of directed influence. So if you know you have influence over people, um, or if you do, whether you know it or not, then we need to ask, well, what is it about you that's influential? Um, to what purposes or goals are you directing your influence, right? What, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Um, and how is that connected to a larger sense of what kinds of things are good or valuable or important? Um, and so the reason I think it's important to include that dimension is that, um, as Steve said, there's a panoply or a myriad of, of understandings of leadership and of leader, and we can quickly fall down rabbit holes where we're trying to debate whether um, such and such world dictator or atrocious person, you know, well, weren't they a leader in some way or other? And it may be true that they they had their own kind of charisma or influence, but I think for this morning, just to, to keep things um, more interesting, um, we would like to focus more on the kinds of positive examples of ethical leadership, right? So not just people who are influential, but people who are taking that influence and, and actually using it for, for good purposes um, in ways that are, that are ethical. Mm, thank you. I think it can be said, you cannot be a leader if there are no people to lead. So Vance, how does that factor into the conversation? I would say there are two ways in which it factors into the conversation. The first is that there are many bumper sticker kinds of slogan that say things like, you're either a leader or you're a follower. And it's, it's very clear from the bumper sticker which of those you're supposed to want to be. And it's very clear which of those you're supposed to not want to be. Um, and you know, there's several kinds of messages that we give and receive like that all the time that suggests that to be the follower is to be a, a sort of sheep or um, someone who is in a really unfortunate position or, or kind of position where you might as well be a, a robot because no sort of independent judgment is required. Um, so what Steve and I talk about a lot in the ethical leadership seminar that we teach is what's called um, by Ira Shalif, um, courageous followership. That means to us and to Shalif uh, a couple of different things. So he wrote a book about this topic and the subtitle of the book is um, Standing Up To and Standing Up For Our Leaders. So that suggests that one really important role in leadership is the ability to, um, and the willingness to listen to the people that you are directing, the people you are influencing, right? Um, to be called out if that might be what's necessary, but in any case, um, to recognize that nothing is going to get accomplished without the people that you're working with thinking that it's something that they want to help you with in the first place. Um, and that they can support you, can challenge you when you need to, um, can remind you of what the, what the mission is, what the values are, right? But, but you need all of those people uh, in any sort of leadership activity or position. And Steve? Uh, when, when I think about followership uh, and advanced talked about it briefly is, is we had this negative connotation to followers. Uh, and there, when we're talking about leadership, very rarely do we talk about followership. So what, what, is that, what does that really mean? Um, one of the things that I, I wanna uh, talk about when I'm talking about followers is uh, 
moving towards a dynamic where the leader and the follower are interchangeable, where there are po points in time where other individuals are leading an organization or leading a group, may not have the title, but they're gonna be integral to the success of where that organization or that group goes. Um, and we need more followers to be willing to take those steps forward. Uh, but it's the role of the leader to develop what that means uh, to to the folks that they are working with. So, as a as a leader, one of one of the things that I stress to students as they are exercising their leadership is how are you helping other individuals to develop the qualities in order to demonstrate their own leadership? And that's your responsibility as a leader to do as you are developing those that you are working with. Uh, and that they have an influence as well on you. It's not just you and the influence as the leader and the positional title uh, them uh, pushing down things to them, but it's also a reciprocal piece. And so we'll talk more about that uh, in, a, in a little bit, but that leader follower dynamic uh, is, is very changing, uh, uh, constantly evolving. I, I show a, a, a sample when I talk about followership in the, in the Olympics, there's a great sport called team speed skating. Uh, I encourage you to take that, take a look online. Uh, but there are pieces of that, uh, those videos where it's really difficult to determine who the leader is because they are so interchanging at all points as they go around the ice skating rink, racing against time. It's really impressive. Uh, and that's how I like to think about followership when I introduce the topic of followership. Mm. Thank you. And Steve, what are other factors that are important in the understanding of leadership? And we'll bring Vance on that in just a moment as well. Yeah, so um, when you're talking about leadership, you're really thinking about it from an individual perspective and a group perspective. So right now I'm gonna talk about it from the individual perspective. Um, as someone is developing uh, their ideas around leadership, it is important to recognize where those thoughts and those, those ideas sort of originated. The first thing I want to share with you is oftentimes our concepts of leadership are uh, established as we are growing up uh, during young um, in, in childhood and adolescence. The ideas of leadership are starting to be reinforced as we are grow growing up and oftentimes as we're growing up. The first concept of leader or leadership is related to a person who has some sort of influence in my life could be a family member could be a religious leader, could be a teacher, could be a public servant, someone who I see that person over there is, is a leader. We start to become more understanding around leadership, uh, moving from them over there to I have the capacity within myself. And oftentimes that takes uh, what we call kind of the tap of leadership, someone tapping you on the shoulder that says, hey, you have some qualities that we, if, we're, if developed, we can really, uh, you can be, uh, exert more influence. Uh, and oftentimes that happens again in those, those childhood adolescence years. So we're starting to understand leadership as we're going and growing uh, up. The other uh, piece I wanna uh, make a uh, mention here is the importance uh, that uh, social identities plays in our understanding of leadership. Race, socioeconomic status, gender, uh, these social identities factor into the way that we think about leadership and are also viewed uh, as a leader. So um, I, I like to use the example of, of uh, gender specifically. Uh, I saw a, um, a meme this morning on the internet and it had a picture of four uh, headlines in um, uh, publications. Uh, and they were all saying uh, something to the effect of, um, this vice presidential candidate uh, just wants to gain more status. This vice president, presidential candidate just wants to gain more influence. Uh, they're not good because of X, Y, Z. And um, ironically, of course, it was all about women. Um, I would ask the question, would we have written those headlines or those articles if it was for men uh, who were uh, striving for a vice president role? So I just use that as an example. Uh, we also say, you know, the little girls are bossy and little boys are exemplifying leadership. Well, that's not the way that we should be thinking about this. Uh, and so uh, gender, race, socioeconomic status, other social identities play a really important factor in our understanding of leadership. 
Thank you. And Vance, other factors? Okay, let's try that again. Uh, I would run with what Steve has said. Um, so the first thing is, as, as we think, especially about Guilford and um, our striving to be a more equitable institution, but we can take this lesson and apply it beyond Guilford. Um, as we think about ways that different social positions um, affect the kinds of lived experiences people have, we realize that that might also shape their sense of what leadership looked like or who we think a leader could be. Um, so back to what Steve suggested just now, that um, if, if you value the trait ambition, but you only value it in, you know, when it appears in a male body, right? And, and when it appears in the, in the form of, of someone who identifies as a woman, you think that that's um, grasping or you think it's, you know, something negative. That, that suggests a problem with a, a, a particularly narrow kind of conception of who could be a leader or, or what traits make up uh, leadership. So I think we need to think about that question, right? Are we, are we striving to broaden our own imagination and, and, and conceptions of who can be a leader? That leads also then to a deeper question, which is, well, what if my social position also shapes what I think leadership is in the first place, right? So leadership might look very different to me um, depending on the kind of community I come from or the sorts of experience that I have, right? So it may be that um, I value a more collaborative style or I value not necessarily being the person who is out front, um, but is still exercising influence in, in a positive way. So one of the things that we need to think about when we are developing leadership capacities in ourselves and others is, well, what do I consider to be a leadership capacity in the first place and, and why, right? And when I'm looking around and trying to encourage and model this for other people or to encourage them to take on different roles, um, am I thinking about the same old roles as before or are there new and more maybe imaginative ways that, that I could encourage people to, to demonstrate leadership that are more consistent with their understanding of the kinds of skills that, that leaders sh uh, should have. Thank you. As we approach the midpoint of our conversation, which again will be um, concluded with some questions at the end, uh, I'm gonna ask both Steve and Vance to answer, what models of leader and leadership have important been important to you? Steve? Yeah, so I think um, when I'm thinking about leadership, uh, I, I really come from a perspective uh, that is, is grounded in relational leadership. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about leadership theory and give you some historical uh, understanding of leadership theory. Uh, it comes from uh, very much a business background in the 1920s and 1930s associated with how can businesses basically make more money? How do I, as a business leader, uh, force my subordinates to do more of what I need them to do. And I intentionally use the word subordinate because that is literally the word that is utilized when uh, they're talking leader and subordinate. <laughs> they're talking about uh, how does this person who is below me uh, help me be able to do what I want them to do, okay? So that is where leadership theory comes from. It wasn't until the 1970s or 1980s uh, that leadership uh, and the thoughts around leadership really are changed. And I um, specifically, I'll, I'll target one book and I'll, I'll be Vanna White here for a few seconds. Transformational Leadership was written um, in uh, 1978 by um, James McGregor Burns and, and his thoughts around leadership transformed the way that we think about leadership uh, as more of an interaction between two people um, and that there are ways that we can transform uh, our groups and our communities to things uh, that are more focused on uh, larger uh, topics like justice and equality um, and away from kind of individualistic and, and opportunistic views of leadership. Uh, so I think about and I and the ways that I talk with our, our students uh, and colleagues about is about how do we um, in a relationship with each other um, that is inclusive, that is ethical, uh, that's grounded in process, be able to help um, a group of individuals uh, come together to make some sort of significant change. I also think about, we can think about it in, in other ways without specific theories per se. Um, there's the knowing, the being, and the doing. So knowing is the head and logic. The being is the internal. Uh, the doing is the action. So 
how are how are we exemplifying leadership in terms of uh, of thinking about it and reflecting about it how we are internally um, const constructing leadership and how we are actually demonstrating leadership and then the other ways that we can think about le leadership is on an individual a group and community level so I spoke a little bit about that that group uh, the individual piece and how does that affect the group how does the group affect me how does the group and the individual affect community how does the community affect a group or an individual so that's these are micro meso and macro levels of thinking about leadership so you can drill down to the individual person but you can also think about leadership in a, in a community oriented uh, manner as well and vance what models have been important to you well, what I like about the examples that Steve has given is um, one of the things that's important to me as I think about leadership models is collaborativeness or collaboration. Um, so a model that's really important to me is one in which maybe there are a variety of people who are working together to achieve a goal. And again, there may not be an organizational chart that shows, okay, this person is the boss of that other person, um, but there is still leadership happening in the collaboration between those people. Um, and they are reaching out to others to join them, right? They are not um, treating what they're doing as their sole possession or as a, an exclusive club that no one else can belong to, right? So they're, they're, they're open and inviting um, of, of shared participation and deliberation. Um, in my ethics courses, I teach a lot um, on uh, various classical Chinese philosophers such as Confucius. And so another model that's important to me comes out of that tradition where the, the way that they thought about what it meant to be a good person was um, exemplified by, by Confucius in, in one of his writings. Well, he didn't actually write it, but um, a saying that's ascribed to him uh, had to do with uh, comparing a, an, a person in a position of effective leadership as being like um, the sun, right? So the sun is the, the body around which other bodies orient themselves and, and orbit. And so he wants the person who's going to be in any kind of formal leadership position to strive to be the person who is such a good person, morally speaking, that they draw other people to them, not out of threat or out of force or out of fear, but out of admiration. Um, and so that to me is another model that's important as thinking, as we think both about leaders and about leadership, right? So again, um, wanting to attract people because they really agree with what you're doing, they want to be part of what you're doing and you want them to be part of what you're doing. So the relational dimension that Steve uh, has, has focused on, I think, is, is one that's really important to me as well. Thank you. Uh, I would like to remind our participants that we will take your questions through chat and consider them uh, for inclusion at the end of the program. So use that feature as you choose. And we, of course, have questions that were submitted in advance that we'll be offering to Steve and Vance in a little while. So let's proceed. Um, so, Steve, what are some crucial traits of leaders and leadership during crises? Yeah, so our time has uh, provided plenty of opportunity, we'll share that, for individuals to demonstrate leadership. Uh, and um, I'll sort of challenge that question slightly in saying that are there traits that are always necessary in every situation? And I think uh, the answer to that is no, it's very, if we had at this point in time developed some sort of uh, list of traits that we would specifically say, do this always and you will be a leader or you will demonstrate leadership, we would have crafted that and we wouldn't have 220 different definitions of leadership. Um, I also, I use this example of, uh, suppose I'm in a, a car accident, I hope to never, never be one where I'm taken to the ER uh, and uh, the, the doctor comes in and says, um, all right, everybody around, what do we think we should happen? What should we, should, what should we do with Steve today? You know, and, and gathering opinions from everybody from all around while I'm laying there, like I'm in pain, I'm hurt. Can you, can someone do something right now? Right. Um, well, I need someone to go in and take command of a particular situation during that particular crisis that, that affects me and having more of a collaborative process during that time period may not be the best way to do that. Um, so oftentimes we say someone who's command going, goes, goes into a situation and commands the situation, um, uh, is not demonstrating leadership or isn't taking other perspectives into account. Well, there are situations where that's not possible, but what there is, if there is possible, 
uh, possibility to gather input, uh, that's really important. I think uh, a trait of a leader uh, that uh, is, is most um, possible to use everywhere, I would say is taking responsibility uh, and being honest uh, with where we're, we are at. Uh, there's a, a level of um, communication that is required uh, as you're demonstrating leadership. There's a um, recognizing one's internal biases and how that may come into play as we're engaging in leadership. Um, I, I think about showing genuine care for others uh, and for the work that is being done. Um, I think those are, are some traits that are uh, universal uh, to the extent that universal can be um, applied. Uh, there are always going to be specific situations where uh, some skill set, some toolbox that you've developed, you're going to be able to pull out that hammer when you uh, need to hammer in the nail. Uh, but using a hammer to try to cut a piece of wood in half is going to be really hard. Uh, and so these traits um, are, are influenced by how you're engaging with others and how you're viewing that particular situation. So recognizing the lenses through which you view the world plays a very important role in how you demonstrate leadership and what traits and behaviors you use to, to demonstrate. Advance, uh, traits of leaders and leadership during crises. So again, um, like Steve, I think it's going to be hard to say that there is a unique set of traits that's going to apply to, to every situation, partly because some crises in a way are self-made um, or they kind of arise out of features of the interaction or the organization or whatever. And, and others really are external, right? So, I mean, for instance, uh, and, and sometimes they interact together, right? So um, as we're living through right now with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the, the pandemic itself is, is, is very much an external crisis, but it then interacts with and can compound, um, you know, other problems or, or dysfunctions that may have already been present, um, but that you didn't know were, were present necessarily, or, or you didn't realize just how serious they were until this now external thing came along. So that's all by way of saying that um, one of the things that's very important, I think, um, during any kind of crisis is to be aware of a lot of the kind of natural psychological biases and cognitive biases that, that we have as humans. Um, so, you know, to, to focus on the short term rather than the long term, um, to want to ascribe um, bad character traits to other people when they do things, but when we do bad things, it's because of the situation we were in, not because of our bad character, right? So there are a lot of biases that are well known like that, that, that can really get in the way of our abilities to um, to think clearly and open-heartedly in these situations. So I think to whatever extent we can do um, some sorts of practice ahead of time or, or just, you know, seek out alternative viewpoints to help shake our own biases up, I think we need to do that. The other thing that I think is important, and, I, and this is just, again, following from what Steve said, um, I think it's, it's really important in leadership positions or when demonstrating leadership um, to be able to admit uncertainty um, and to be able to say, um, there's not a conflict between communicating openly and also being uncertain, right? That it's okay to communicate uncertainty and that's far preferable than portraying a sense of false certainty or a false hope if you, if you can't provide those things. Um, and that also means that as a person in leadership or, or someone demonstrating leadership, it's really important to admit uh, your dependency on others. This goes back to the um, discussion we had a minute ago about followership um, and to enlist support, right? So, People may be looking to particular positions of leadership to say, save us, right, or get us out of this. And the people in leadership may, may have to say, well, I, I can't, right? Um, for one thing, I may be part of the reason that we're in this crisis. Um, but for another thing, um, I, I alone am not going to be able to get us out of it, right, that we're all going to have to do this together. So I think the willingness and, and indeed the um, sort of obligation um, to approach people with that mindset is another important trait. Thank you. So how does ethical leadership play out in our current times? Steve? Yeah, I, I, I think Vance uh, spoke to this a bit uh, a moment ago, and I'm really glad he shared uh, those, those perspectives. Um, we are at a uh, crisis point in our nation. Uh, there's the pandemic, 
there's the protests around racial justice, there's the pressures on our economy, there's the global strifes that are happening. There are so many things that are happening on a big scale. And then uh, there are also those crises that are happening on the local scale or the individual scale, what's happening with our own households, what's happening within our own communities uh, that are of course, affected by the national crises and the global crises that we have. Um, when I think about how ethical leadership plays out during this particular time, um, I, I think about a couple things. Uh, one is around competing priorities. Um, how we view these conflicts is, a, is how we view the world, as I mentioned before, about these lenses with which we view the world. And if we see these uh, crises as, um, a competition for resources, for example, or uh, having competing priorities, right? We're, we're looking right now to use a, a, a local, how do we send uh, students back to school safely? And so there's multiple priorities and that are competing in this particular example of, um, we have an economic aspect to this, we have an individual health aspect to this, we have the long-term goal of education uh, that is part of this. And those aren't the only priorities that are competing, but these are some of the priorities that are competing with this individual decision that um, leaders and those who are demonstrating leadership have to make. So I, I want to share that as a way of thinking about, we'll talk here in a few moments about how Guilford College views ethical leadership, but really this view, this, this ethical leadership playing out in this time is based in one's personal ethics as they're making these particular decisions and the competing priorities around such. And so Vance, ethical leadership, how does it play out if you'll expand on that? Well, I'll be very quick about this. Um, several of you I'm sure are familiar with um, some of the short articles and memes that have been going around over the last several months that have um, tried to compare countries um, whose leadership is um, uh, with female leadership uh, to, to countries with male leadership in terms of their national responses to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and part of the point of the comparison, um, I think, um, is, to, uh, is to suggest that there's something about perhaps a quote unquote, you know, feminine leadership style that um, makes, their, uh, makes them better suited uh, to, to handle crises like this one. Um, whatever you think about the merits of that particular um, exercise or the conclusion, um, I do think it's interesting to to think about ways in which um, you know the combination of different national political cultures and, and different expectations uh, that we have for people in leadership positions, but also different social cultures um, plays a role in which you know it affects the ways in which different communities are responding to the very same thing. So I I think that when we talk about um, ethical leadership playing out in current times, right? One thing I think that's important to emphasize is that ethics is never just a matter of personal individual rectitude, right? The, it's, it's very much a matter of um, the social environment that you're, that you're part of, the political economy that you're part of, um, you know, who is in your community as well. Thank you, Vance. So, uh, as Steve mentioned a moment ago, uh, let's talk about Guilford College's ethical leadership program. And Vance, I'm going to come back to you on that, um, if you will get us started there. Sure. So, um, I'm happy to talk about this um, all day, and Steve uh, as well. Uh, several of you are familiar with what's called the Guilford Edge, which is a, a series of transformations to the kind of education that our Guilford students get, as well as some transformations to the, the college community itself. Ethical leadership is one of the four components of, of that transformation. And it's conceived of both as a kind of curricular or maybe co-curricular program for students to take, but also as a way for Guilford to reconceive itself as an institution. Um, Steve and I were asked by Jane, um, this would have been four years ago now, um, to co-lead a, a sort of task force consisting of staff, faculty, and students from across the campus um, to think about what ethical leadership would look like at Guilford, what we wanted it to look like at Guilford, what were some things that we were already doing here at Guilford, uh, particular curricular programs that might be prime examples of ethical leadership or of ethical leadership development. 
So Steve and I, as I mentioned, spent a summer um, and then a fall uh, working with that task force. Um, and we formulated, among other things, a, a particular model of what ethical leadership might look like at Guilford. So if you will indulge me for a second, um, I'm going to um, put the model on the screen so that uh, all of you can see it. Uh, so the Guilford College ethical, mo ethical leadership model is, um, should be on everybody's screen right now. Um, there's a lot going on in this little diagram, so I'm, I'm going to try to walk you through it um, uh, in a way I hope is helpful. So the, the outer circle at the top says ethical decision making and at the bottom says moral imagination. And those things are meant to indicate the context in which we're, we're talking about ethical leadership to begin with, right? So the context is one in which we want people um, or maybe people need to be making some kind of ethical decision. That also requires what Steve and I call moral imagination. Moral imagination um, is the capacity to imagine things from different perspectives, right? To imagine alternatives, to question the assumptions that you're taking into the situation, um, and to really think beyond um, wherever you might be at the moment. Then the different components of the model, um, as Steve mentioned a few minutes ago, talking about different uh, dimensions of leadership, there's the, the individual, the group, and the societal um, dimensions of ethical leadership. Uh, and so the different components that are listed inside of each of those circles indicate what we, as our group, as our task force, felt were some of the things that we want our program to emphasize um, and things that we want our students in particular to be developing, um, right? So achieving a greater self-understanding, um, being able to work together with a variety of people who are different in different ways, um, working towards the promotion of positive social change, again, because this is an ethical leadership model, you know, not just a leadership model. And then the, the seven values that are spelled out uh, in the middle of the diagram are the, the sort of core values of Guilford College. Um, and so again, that's a way of reminding everyone why we're here um, and what this model ultimately is in the service of, right, is in the promotion of, of those particular values. Um, I will add one more thing, uh, sure. which is that, um, so we, we, have a, we have a curriculum that goes along with this as well. So I think Steve was probably about to talk about that. <laughs> Please go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Vance. Yeah, so, um, Utilizing this ethical leadership model, um, I, I will share that that Vance and I helped to sort of pr provide the groundwork for this model, and then and now the initiative is sort of shifted over to our um, DEI, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion area, with uh, leadership of uh, Barbara Lawrence and Krishana Heinz Gaither. Uh, they're now taking on sort of the, the how to move this forward um, in in various ways. So a couple things just associated with that. Uh, we have, as Vanson mentioned, uh, Vance and I, and uh, it's a pleasure every day I walk into the classroom with Vance, I learn so much. Uh, I have the opportunity to learn from him as our students have the opportunity to learn from him. So um, we, are, we uh, are teaching uh, seminars around ethical leadership for students who are interested in exploring uh, leadership and what these concepts mean. Uh, this semester, we're focusing more on the, the group and societal levels versus the in versus the individual levels. Um, the ethical leadership model is being presented to various groups around campus and how are those campus groups able to tap into uh, this these thoughts around ethical leadership. Um, so when we uh, are starting to use common language as an institution around what we expect students to be thinking about as they're demonstrating ethical leadership. So I'm excited where this is headed in terms of the, the opportunities on campus for students to learn about ethical leadership. And see, that's a great segue into what will be our final um, planned question, and that is about student leadership opportunities on Guilford's campus. And maybe you could get us started with that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think the um, the thing I would mention here is that uh, a college campus provides plenty of opportunities for students to uh, demonstrate leadership uh, as they step foot on campus and as they leave campus and still engage with our Guilford College community. So uh, any time that you enter a college campus, there are plenty of opportunities to develop and uh, these, these skills and these behaviors, these traits, uh, however we might want to call it. When we're talking about opportunities specifically on Guilford's campus, 
Um, we have in our first year residence halls, we have ethical leaders in action. And uh, these are pods in, within the residence halls where people are having conversations about ethical leadership as they get to campus. Uh, we're infusing it as part of leadership trainings for our student leaders who uh, have assumed uh, leadership roles. As I mentioned before, just because you have a title doesn't mean you're demonstrating leadership. Uh, so how do we help build these capacities within those of our, um, within the organization, uh, within the student organizations that we have? Um, I specifically will highlight our uh, Office of Student Leadership and Engagement and one pr particular program called Sprout, uh, where uh, the, the curriculum itself is around this ethical leadership model. Um, and even so much as when we're in the classroom and students are engaging with each other in group work, how do we, you know, a group is an opportunity for students to engage in leadership. How do we talk about ethical leadership in groups uh, for a you know, project that we're doing for a particular class? It doesn't necessarily need to be in a leadership class, but there is plenty of leadership that's happening on our campus. Um, in formal settings, such as student organizations, uh, as sports teams, uh, things along those lines, and also informal opportunities such as group projects. Uh, so we are working through and, and, and sharing this, this model with, with our community as a way of helping to um, systematize the language that we're using around leadership and what we think ethical leadership is uh, for students as they're developing. And Vance, would you like to add to that, please? I would, with just one other example, one of which I think is one of our crown jewels, and that's the Guilford Undergraduate Symposium, also known as GUS. Uh, many of you are familiar with that, and, and several of you, I think, on this call um, have actually been instrumental in um, helping it happen, either financially or, or in other important ways. That, uh, for those who don't already know, uh, is an annual showcase of the myriad um, uh, academic research and creative uh, endeavors that our students have undertaken. So any student from any course or major um, can uh, do a performance or, or present a paper or a poster or some kind of research that they've done. Um, and again, that's an opportunity to reconceive what leadership look like, looks like, uh, because again, it's, it's um, organizing that is not a small thing. Uh, and also the ability to um, stand in front of an audience maybe and, and talk about some idea that's really important to you can sometimes take a lot of courage, but can also be an important influence on other people and, and can help shape conversations that are happening, uh, not just among students at Guilford, but uh, between students and faculty as well. So I see that also as another form of leadership development here at the college that's, that's really significant. Mm. Thank you, Vance. Um, and thanks to both you and Steve for the very nice presentation. And I believe we've got some, some, some noise leaking in. Okay. Um, so now it's time uh, to engage with our participants uh, in a period of questions and answers. And we had, as I mentioned, some submitted prior to today. We have some submitted today. Uh, and we'll get to as many as we can here in the next uh, uh, 12 to 14 minutes uh, before we conclude this session. And I'm going to uh, first, though, uh, mention that one of our participants has requested uh, the sharing of the copy of the ethical leadership model um, that Vance uh, offered earlier. Is that possible, uh, Vance and Steve? Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, there is a website whose URL I don't know offhand um, where people could go to find that, but um, I'm also happy, um, I might be able to post a link in the doc in the chat room, chat window here. Um, there may also be, I don't know, is there a different way, Ty, that people who've attended this talk when they receive the video, um, maybe that this link could be included as well, the link to the document? We would be absolutely happy to share any other materials and um, and we'll do that in the next several days. So Vance, Great. share with us. Happy to put that in the chat if, the, if it's possible uh, for those who are most uh, interested right away. Okay, uh, well, let's go into our, our, our period of questions and we do have some that, uh, we do have some that have come up. And I'd like to uh, share a question that came to us in advance of the program from Kathy Coe. Kathy is a trustee emerita uh, living out in Colfax. Um, she says, we are living in an age when we constantly ask, what is truth? In a world that's flooded with fractured media, as well as social media, 
how does the ethical leader not only determine what is true, but then present that truth to the public in such a way that guarantees or at least demonstrates its authenticity? Vance or Steve, would you like to uh, take a stab at that? Vance, why don't you talk about truth? Because that's our that's a philosophy topic. And then I'll, I'll jump in about <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Kathy, for the question. <laughs> yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, so yes, as a as a philosophy professor, this is an occupational hazard that uh, I'm uh, compelled to talk about truth sometimes. Um, I guess to go back to what I said earlier about the, the well-known cognitive and psychological biases that we all have, um, I would start by saying that, that anyone in any kind of leadership position should proceed with a great deal of caution about their own access to what they think is truth. Um, as well as um, their priors, right? Their, their prior assumptions that they're, that they're bringing to the conversation or to the situation. Um, in this particular case, what I think you're also describing um, has been written about and analyzed um, pretty often over the last couple of years, perhaps especially since 2016 with terms like uh, filter bubbles and echo chambers. Um, there are people in this call, I think, who have um, much more uh, and, and more uh, much deeper psychological and sociological knowledge than I do about what are some effective ways of busting out of filter bubbles or, or breaking out of echo chambers. But I think at the very least, it would start with recognizing that, that pretty much all of us are in one of those things at, at some time or other. Um, so to sum up, uh, and I don't know that this counts as a summary, I, I have not given up on the notion of truth. I think we need the notion of truth. Um, I think, first of all, you, you can't solve problems if you can't acknowledge that they are problems, um, right? Um, that doesn't mean there couldn't be different ways of um, solving the problems, but, but a refusal even to acknowledge them, I think, is, is a real failure of leadership uh, pretty often. So I think it's really important to do what you can to look for um, a range of perspectives, which doesn't imply that any perspective is just as good as any other, but it does imply that um, when I'm trying to get the best information that I can, um, I need to be able to step out of what I already think is obvious. And Steve? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll take the, the, the leadership aspect of that in terms of um, how one acts upon what they know to be true, right? So I mentioned before the, the knowing being doing, um, uh, Vance talked about the echo chamber and, and how do we gather the information that we best utilize to make decisions, how we weigh that information in making decisions, what biases underlying that, that weighing of the information. Um, but then there is also a way that um, uh, breeds trust in the way that you are um, speaking your truth. Uh, and when I share that, I say, um, as a relationship between leader and follower, um, there has to be a level of trust that, that exists in order for uh, the impact of that leader uh, to, to, to be able to demonstrate the impact uh, that that leader is having. So if there is no trust in between a particular leader and a particular follower, then the impact of whatever the, the, the leader is sharing is, is not going to go over well. Uh, no matter what happens. Um, they are going to, and, and this is where, uh, as Vance had mentioned before, uh, the, the courageous follower uh, then you know, has to act on that information. Do I remain to be a part of that group? Can I get out of that group? Is there a way for me to challenge the uh, quote unquote authority associated with that? Uh, and so uh, that level of trust that has to exist uh, between the uh, leader and the follower uh, is, is, is sort of the underpinning for me of um, how something happens or gets done. I will share, um, uh, there's uh, f five exemplary practices of leadership. There's a book called uh, Five Exemplary Practices of Leadership, The Leadership Challenge uh, by Jim Cousins and Barry Posner. Uh, one of their um, uh, five exemplary practices is uh, establishing a common vision, okay? So it's not just that the leader comes out and says, this is where we are headed, but this is where we are gathering a bunch of input together to figure out where we are going together as a group and moving forward. Uh, and so um, I, I shared that specific as an example of that relationship between the leader and the follower, where the follower is able to have an influence on a particular leader 
to help shape where we are headed. Um, there are specific examples where uh, an elected leadership who are supposed to be serving uh, the will of the people, depending on how you want to view that particular uh, perspective, um, where people are either supporting or not supporting the direction uh, of, of that particular leader. And so uh, I see that as uh, sort of in our representative democracy, how we can influence how uh, leadership um, enacts its changes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a few minutes remaining and I'd like to get to two more questions. And so uh, Steve and Vance, if you'll uh, answer those as, as best you can in the time we have. One is from Kate Gibson. Kate's uh, class of 2014 living up in Richmond. And Kate asks a very pointed question and that is, what can alumni do to affect change when they see or perceive that the college is falling short on ethical leadership? Uh, Vance or Steve? or Steve? I'll, I'll take a stab first, Vance, if that's okay. okay. Sure. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned about uh, the, the dynamic between individuals, uh, this leadership dynamic, uh, there's already a previous relationship with alumni and an institution, and so I'm going to take a step back and just um, start with that perspective. Um, the, the ways that um, that relationship is, persists um, many, many individuals, I think Vance may be uh, a, a lonely uh, example of having a long-term relationship as a student transitioning into faculty and now into an administrative role within the institution. So we have, we have an expert here in terms of uh, the different roles here, here at Guilford. Uh, but the alum relationship to an institution is a different type of relationship. Uh, it's not the same as a faculty or as a staff member, um, or as a student. And so recognizing that there's a new relationship in there. Uh, what I would encourage, and I know that I've seen at Guilford more so than maybe many, many other institutions, is to use a collective voice within the alumni body to affect change on, on campus. Um, I know when decisions are made and people are not happy with a particular decision, uh, being able to utilize their voice uh, to be able to, to try to be heard uh, in collaboration and connection with others that, that, that see change. Uh, and I see this not just here at Guilford, but in other places, thinking about the relationships. What is my relationship to my uh, religious faith organization or my service organization that I'm a part of? Um, where, what about my work? Where do I have influence in my work? How do I gather other people to be on the same, um, to have that same shared vision to be able to affect, uh, affect change? Um, there are, of course, the processes that are afforded, and then there are also other ways to be able to get one's um, perspective out there, uh, so that way it's being considered. Um, so that was my, my a, a few thoughts associated with um, how does one body who's dissatisfied with a decision or the, the, that where an institution is heading, a broader institution is heading, can affect where that institution is going. Mm, thank you. And Vance, uh, and we have just a few minutes remaining. Okay, so I, I will try to be succinct. Um, so as Steve said, I, I'm an alum of the college, as I think several of you know. Um, so this particular question and, and ones like it are, I think, particularly poignant for me because um, I'm an alum who works at the college, has worked at the college for many years, and, and you know, have felt let down, I think, in many ways over the years by different college decisions um, in similar ways that other alums who don't work here um, may have felt as well. I think also, when you're part of an institution like Guilford or like some of the other kinds of institutions Steve mentioned um, that explicitly appeal to certain values as, as core to their identity, that can make uh, the sense that that institution is falling short um, even sharper, right? And may, may make the sense of betrayal or disillusionment uh, even more acute. So I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, as alum, um, as Steve said, I think being able to channel that feeling or the, those feelings into a kind of shared response is important. But now to connect it to the previous question that was asked about truth and, and trust, one of the things that I think makes it easier to, um, to be part of a conversation if there is, is if there has been already a kind of ongoing relationship, um, right? So if, if there's a prior relationship and someone is coming to you and saying, hey, you all messed up, or I think you all messed up, and, and here's what you need to do differently, that's going to land differently than it will from someone who has not been in touch with you and, and you know, 
15 years later is, is, is bothered about something. I, obviously, it's a practical matter. You, you don't, you're not going to stay in touch with um, everyone from every prior stage of your lives. But I think one way that, that um, alum can be effective in conveying their, their displeasure um, or their sense of disappointment or, or just challenging us to do better as a, as a college um, is by having had those kinds of ongoing connections. Vince, thank you, and Steve as well. Uh, we've come to the end of our time, um, and we had a couple of other questions that were posed, one about servant leadership, one about uh, uh, the reopening of the college and things like that. We appreciate those questions, uh, and I hope that you um, uh, may feel comfortable reaching out to uh, either Vance or Steve, if that would be okay. Um, I'm sorry, it could not be a part of our, our week conversation. I want to once again thank both Vance and Steve. You can tell uh, what a pleasure it is for us who work at Guilford to be able to be their colleagues. And we thank you for being a part of the fourth Guilford College Last Thursday Coffee Chat. Um, I want to encourage all of you as participants to uh, respond to our post um, coffee chat survey that will come to you by email. Uh, your feedback helps us improve these programs. Uh, so please do take a moment to respond when you receive that. Also, please mark your calendars for August 27th when we intend to have the next coffee chat and more details about that will be coming up later. So thanks to all of you again. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Steve and Vance, for being a big part of this. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all in August. Take care, be well, and uh, thank you again.